Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. Ephesians 4, verse 22, as we march our way through the book of Ephesians. We have already looked at the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, we read a fact and became aware of the fact that God has chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. The reason for that is that we can't choose God. When you and I were born, we were totally depraved. We were totally lost, and every bent of our heart was against God. In fact, Romans chapter 5 says, we were enemies of God. We're born with a sinful heart. And so God chose us before the foundation of the world, and then his son came and made provisions thereby which we could get to heaven. He paid for the sins of the world from Adam to, to his death on the cross, from his death on the cross till the last person that will ever be born as a human being at the end of time. So Paul has been telling us this, and he's been telling us of the great doctrines. Then in chapter 4, he moves into practical living. You have to have biblical teaching in order to have proper living. You have to, you know, the Bible tells us that as a man thinks, so is he. And so the thinking process has to be corrected, and it has to be corrected from the Word. And as your mind is then taking in the Word of God and dwelling on the Word of God, you soon see it in action and actions. So the process of the Christian life is a continual, steady growth, taking in the Word of God. That's why we teach the Word of God. That's why it's so important. Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday school, we teach the Word of God. That's the way it is. When we look at chapter 4, he reminds us and he says, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, remember Paul is writing this from prison. We call it a prison epistle because that's where he's writing this. He isn't moaning and groaning about the fact that he's in prison. <clears throat> he's not doing those things. <clears throat> in fact, he is continually living his life with the Lord. He was chained to a Roman soldier. Now think about that. A soldier who is a pure Gentile pagan Roman is chained to the Apostle Paul. He hears his daily prayers. He sees his daily readings. He's in every conversation that Paul has with every Christian that ever came to visit with him. As a result of being in prison, his testimony is so strong, his words for Christ are so great that the prison becomes the means by which God enters the palace at Rome all the way to the top. And according to 2 Timothy, it's very possible that the Apostle Paul te made a testimony before the most infinite infamous ruler that ever lived, Nero, from the, from the prison house. Now, if you and I were doing it, we'd start, he'd have a grand entrance right into the place, and the Caesar would greet him. Uh, God's ways are not our ways. Starts with the lowest, brings him in as a prisoner, and evangelizes the whole palace from the prison. Talks about our Lord in here. Talks about us in the middle of that chapter. He ascended and descended. He came down and he gave gifts. He gave gifts to the church. First of all, the apostles. No apostle is alive today. The last one was John. And he gave gifts. Prophets. No prophets are alive today or ministering. They all ceased as well. The prophets, the apostles are the 12 that Jesus chose not Judas. Judas killed himself, hung himself, and he appointed Matthias in his place. And then he also called Paul as the other apostle, the one born out of due season. These are the men who wrote the scriptures. These are the men who set the doctrine. Or as if you've been listening to television last week, these are the ones who wrote the constitution of the church, the Bible. And that's what we live by. 
And the big question that you heard last week was, is the Constitution a living organism we change in time or we go back and hold to what it says? That's the issue. Does the Constitution keep changing as time changes or is it a stated fact and do we hold to it? And that's what we do with the Bible. It's a stated fact, we hold to it. We don't change because time changes because the hearts of men are the same 2,000 years ago as they are today. Nothing changes. So he writes a book, and so the apostles and prophets have ceased, but they left their writings for us. Then he gave evangelists, we'd probably call them our missionaries, going where no, the word has never been taught before. Then he gave pastors hyphen teachers, and these men are to take the word of God, which is written, pastors and teachers, shepherd and teach, the people, the Word of God. And you know what's interesting? Every born-again Christian has the residence of the Holy Spirit. They already know the truth. So if you're really a believer and you sometimes wonder, you know the truth. The Holy Spirit knows the truth. No false teaching is within Him. And so sometimes you hear, hear a speaker and you say, uh, I don't know what's wrong here, but something's wrong. I don't know. And then you hear another guy and you say, that's it. That's the Word of God. That's the Holy Spirit agreeing with the message of the Holy Spirit. I call it, you know, they used to have gauges in your cars when I grew up. They told you the temperature, told you the RPMs, told you all about your car, how many amps were being produced, etc. They did away with all that because it came too confusing. So they put a little light on Repair engine soon. Now, when you're listening to a message, you have a dashboard, and it may say, air. Hold back. Back off. Go to the Word and see if this is true. Check me out. I appreciate when you check me out. I don't have any qualms with that. And I don't have any qualms with people coming up and say, what do you actually believe about this? I'll tell you, I, I, I'm glad to share that with you. I'm here to teach the Word of God. And so we're, he told us these are gifts to keep men from going to and fro and tossing. And we went through that passage. I've been in the ministry over 50 years. And I've seen it come and go. I've seen, remember the prayer of Jabez? That was hot. T-shirts, everything. Wearing bracelets, what would Jesus have you to do? Little bracelets, remember them? And remember this little system on how do you, how do you, uh, how do you win a soul to Christ? There's this little system, then there's this system, and there's this system, when all you have to do is tell them the, what the Word of God says. I've seen all of that come and go. And it's a Word of God that stabilizes us and keeps us, and that's what he talked about in his chapter. Then in verse 17, he said, So I say and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk or no longer walk, walk no longer as the Gentiles who also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, and having become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. You didn't learn Christ this way. So he goes back and he explains the world. And that's the world you and I live in. The futility of mind really is empty-minded, empty-headed. You stop and think about it. The dominating theory in our schools in the world is evolution. God didn't create the world, so they say. This world is billions and billions of years ago, and every one of us had our ancestors started in some little pool where lightning hit it and amoeba started. The amoeba grew and changed, and finally we came along. The, sign, the, world, the biblical word for that is hogwash. God created it. And he did it in six 24-hour days. 
And the world is so empty-headed, they don't like God, they don't want God, so they exclude God. And we know the answer to what came first, the chicken or the egg. The chicken did. He came first. So God gave us wisdom. Now in verse 22, he says, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. In the three verses, I hope to get through this morning, the three verses have three phrases in each verse. They're all the same. They're infinitives. And they're all the same. You have laid aside the old self in verse 22. The main phrase in verse 23, you continually be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And verse 24, having or have put off, put on the new self. These three phrases. What's interesting is when you read this in the original language, you read, the first words are, you lay aside the old self. Even though in English, it doesn't show up very clear. Now, when, when they wrote the Greek, they didn't worry about word order like we do in English. But they always put the important line at the beginning of a sentence. That's what they wanted to emphasize. So the emphasis in verse 22 is you laid aside, you have laid aside the old self, or you lay aside. It's in past tense, so it refers to something that happened in the past. And, and, uh, and, and these phrases all are objects of what we read in verse 21. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as the truth is in Jesus, if you believe that, if you've heard that, then you know that you've laid aside the old man or the old self. That happened at conversion, by the way. Now, a lot of us grew up in Christian, Christian homes and where, the God, where God was honored and we went to church and and some of us, like me, we went to church whether we wanted to or not. It wasn't really an issue. I remember one time I got tired of church and I didn't want to go, so I figured out in my brilliance that there was no lock to the bathroom door. You, there was no key to get in there. You could lock it, but you couldn't, there was no key to get in there. So in a brilliant act of rebellion, I decided I'm locking myself in the bathroom and my dad will not break down the door. He's too scotch to do that. They can go without me. That little German came through the door like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> and I finished dressing on the way to church. But it's hard to sit down. But, I, but it happened. We're to lay us. I don't even know why I said that. <laughs> but I hope you enjoyed it. He said, you're to lay aside your old self. Oh, I know what I said. Uh, a lot of us grew up in Christian homes where we went to church, come what may. That didn't save us going to church or going through the ordinances of the church. I've been baptized twice. Because the first time I wasn't a Christian at all. I went through the catechism class, and I had uh, total rebellion. I was a senior in high school. I waited. You could go as a junior, but I waited as long as I could. Finally, I had to go. It wasn't until later that I became a believer in Jesus Christ when I realized God saved me forever. When I put my faith and trust in God, his mercy was more than my sin, as we sang about. And he dumped all my sin in the bottomless, shoreless ocean, the bottom of the sea, far as the east is from the west. So at, at that point of conversion, of being saved, of trusting in Jesus Christ, being born again, that's when I laid aside the old self. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.17. It'll be on the board for you. Therefore, 
if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. You could also translate that word creation. He's something new. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, what are the old things? Well, we read about in verses 17, 18, and 19. One time you were empty-headed. As far as God is concerned, you are empty-headed. You bought the things of the world. You bought all these things. You didn't think right. We can tell that. I mean, you don't have to be a brilliant scholar to figure out there's a lot of nonsense in this world. There's a lot of things that you and I see as believers that are just pure nonsense in the world. Furthermore, that verse, that former life told us that we were darkened in our understanding. Word of God doesn't mean anything. You may enjoy the preaching if the guy's kind of good and can flow. You may enjoy that. But you walk out of there and you haven't learned anything about God. You haven't learned anything about life. You haven't learned anything about the Spirit moving and controlling your life. You don't know anything about the second coming of Christ. Prior to your salvation, you didn't even know if he's going to come. And secondly, you could have cared less. You're living your own life, and you're living it to the fullest. Our hearts became calloused. We became calloused. And we went by our feelings, how we felt. Not about, on facts. You heard that, too. We, uh, we ought to go by our feelings, rather than what the Constitution says, what the Bible says. We're new creatures. Old things have passed away. At the moment of salvation, you're no longer actually empty-headed. You're no longer darkened, and you're no longer hardened or callous. You're soft to the gospel. Suddenly it makes sense. Suddenly I enjoy this. You know, a lot of people don't come to this church. They wouldn't enjoy it here. Let's just face it. They wouldn't enjoy this. Why would you come and hear a few songs? Maybe they sound good, but then they got this preacher. They're just lousy. He just talks about the word. That doesn't, that doesn't really appeal to them. It only appeals to people who truly love God. Old things are passed away. Romans chapter 6. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, where he talks about our salvation. At that time, we placed our faith and trust in him. And he says this, For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly, we shall also be the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin and he who has died is free from sin. Now, this is all part of it. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you were united with Jesus Christ. You became one with him personally. He died, you died. He was buried, you are buried, called baptism. Now, when people hear the word baptism, they right away want to run to a pool. They right away run to run to water. There's other baptism. There's a baptism of fire John the Baptist spoke about. There's a baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's a baptism of Moses, and in the baptism of Moses, when you talk about that, who got baptized there? Pharaoh's army. They all got baptized. They're all immersed in the water, and that was the end of them. Then there's Christian baptism, where a person who professes to be saved knows Jesus Christ, submits to the water of baptism. Then there's this baptism of the Holy Spirit, of which we're talking about. The word means identification. 
When you got baptized by John the Baptize, Baptizer, bab, bab, the John the Baptist, when you got baptized by him, you were identified with John, his message, and his followers. When you're baptized as a Christian, you are baptized, you are saying publicly, I place my faith and trust in Christ, and I now am identifying myself with the congregation of believers. This is my public testimony. Now, the baptism we're speaking of in Romans 6 is that which identifies us with Christ. It's not water at all. It's spirit. And when we accepted Christ, we're one with Christ. We were buried with Christ. We will rise again with Christ. He is our life. We're one with him. Our old self, he says in verse 6 of Romans 6, was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Problem. Prior to our conversion, we were slaves to sin. You couldn't help it. Or you could resist the bad ones. But what about gossip? What about slander? What about some of these other sins? You know, we, we think of the bad ones, murder, lying, cheating. Yeah, they're bad. We were guilty of that, too. If you hated somebody, Jesus said you might as well have murdered them. Jesus said if you thought a lustful thought in your heart, you, might, you really have committed adultery. When you start looking at it at that particular standard, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Nobody escapes that. Nobody. Nobody's perfect. And that's the way we lived. We would justify certain sins. We'd make excuses for certain sins. And suddenly now we're born again. We, we, those things are passed. Now we're conscious of it. I speak some ill of some other person behind their back. I, I, I should be feeling guilty about that. I don't read my Bible. I should be feeling, hey, I need to be in a word. I need to tell people about the Lord. My whole life has changed. My whole outlook has changed. I'm a new creature in Christ. That's what he's saying. That we don't, we're not slaves to that anymore. For he who has died is free from sin. So now back in Ephesians 4, he says that you have laid that aside. That has been laid aside. Uh, there's a principle too. You, keep, you have to keep reminding yourself of this. I don't think you have to pray about it. Do I, should I lay aside the old cell? I don't think that's a necessary thing to pray about. That's something you do. He says, in reference to your former manner of life, that old previous life, the old man, the one of rebellion, the one against holiness, the one against God and his word, the one who rejects Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, which is being corrupted according with the lusts of deceit. <clears throat> That old man is still corrupting you and me. How does this happen? When I became a child of God, when I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, did I get a new brain? You hope so, but it didn't. I didn't. Do I quit liking chocolate? No. Did I quit liking the Chiefs? No. I still the same person, right? When a person puts his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that might be in a moment of time when you came to realization and you said to yourself, you know, I'm a rotten, dirty sinner. I need to repent. Jesus, I'm a sinner. Save me. I trust that you died on the cross for me and that you paid my penalty. I want to be one of yours. That's being born again. That's trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. When that happened, you were still the same person. You know what happened? You became a new man. And that old man died. As far as God is concerned, you're a new man. You're in Christ. I'm not going to do that, but I used to do this. And my wife said, I don't like you taking off your coat and showing the shirt. I used to take off my coat and I'd say, okay, this is where I was 
That's the old man. Then I placed my faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and he gave me a brand new coat, a coat of righteousness. So when I am justified, declared just, declared right, I stand before God sinless. Got it? I'm as sinless as Jesus Christ is sinless. When he looks at me from his throne, he sees Rod sinless. Okay? That's the way he sees me. I'm righteous in Christ. Am I righteous every day? I sin at least once last year on a Thursday. I sin every day. I'm a sinner saved by grace. That old man keeps corrupting me, present tense. Now, the Bible calls it flesh sometimes. Our flesh is not sin, but our human flesh becomes the vehicle, becomes the door by which it brings in the temptations that existed prior to my salvation. I lay aside, I got to reckon in my mind, I've laid aside it. Now, I've been on every diet known to man. I've eaten grapefruits till I can't eat them anymore. I've eaten eggs till I can't handle it anymore. I've been to this class and that class. I sat in one class, died, I lost 40 pounds. The lady said, by now you should know what is dietary food. And I said, sure, I know. It looks like cardboard, tastes like cardboard, and it is cardboard. <laughs> um, nobody laughed but my friend. Now, you know the way I can ha I can't go into a buffet, even though, remember Jesus said to not buffet your body? I read that, buffet your body. <laughs> now, I have to learn that when I go through the line, I don't have to have that extra helping. I can make a choice. Now, we can do that with sin. Now, there's two ways to do this. I can say in my strength, I will gut it through. I won't do it. I'll be stoic about it. I won't do this. You know what happens then? You become a legalist. You set a standard that you try to live up to. And you'll lower the standard so you can live up to it and justify your own sin and condemn everybody else that doesn't meet your standard. Well, let me tell you something. God's standard is much higher than my standard or your standard would ever be. You need the help of the Holy Spirit here to enable you to do what Jesus prayed in his prayer. Lead me not into what? Temptation. You got to lay that aside. You got to pray and pray and say, lead me not into temptation. This is a weakness in my life. Every one of us have a weakness. We don't know what that weakness is, but you know what that weakness is. You give in every time. You can't handle when people talk about other people of jumping in and gossiping. I just read in, uh, in Proverbs in my daily reading not too long ago, seven sins that the Lord hates. Four of them have to do with the tongue. What would you say is the most common sin in a Bible teaching church? I'd say the tongue, wouldn't you? I say some pretty bad stuff goes on in the foyers of Bible teaching churches or parking lots, or in friends, wouldn't you? We would raise, we would raise all kinds of cane if somebody would smoke out here in marijuana. And we should. 
But some of the sins that sometimes go on in a foyer and parking lot are far worse than that. So whatever our weakness is, it keeps coming, keeps coming at us. We're to lay it aside. In Romans 7, 5, we read this. For while we're in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear the fruit of death. We know that. The law doesn't help. If we put up a law here, wet paint, do not touch, what's the first temptation? The law stirs up sin, doesn't it? First thing you do, do not enter here. First thing you want to do, enter. The law stirs it up. So we're to lay this aside. Notice how he says it in Scripture in physical way. Romans 13, 12, the night is almost gone, the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness, put on the armor of light. Ephesians 4, 25, you can turn to it, but I'll read it. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, one truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. There's the sin of the tongue. Colossians 3, 8. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, abuse of speech from your mouth. The sins of the tongue and attitude. No Christian ought to be running around holding anger, grudges, bitterness, malice, slander, abuse of speech. It all has to be put away. I like this one, Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we have been so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The sin which so easily besets us, and we all have it. What are we supposed to do with it? Lay aside. You're not going to run a, run a race. I, never, I was not a track suit. Track, I was not a track suit. I wasn't a track high school. Um, I remember I hurt my knee, and I went into the, to the knee guy. Um, and he had, he had actually uh, worked on Joe Namath's knees, and he said Joe Namath would give anything he could to have knees like you. And he said, are you a runner? And I said, do I look like one? <laughs> he said, no. But he said, I'll get the runners later. <laughs> I eventually get them. But the point is, the point is, we don't run races with combat boots. We strip off everything we can to run the race. And especially, the writer of the Hebrews says, Take off that encumbrance. We ask the question, what is the obstacle that keeps us from serving the Lord? What is that obstacle that just keeps you from going whole hog and serving the Lord? What is it? You don't have to raise your hand and answer it, but what, answer it yourself. What is it that keeps you from making that next step? What is it that keeps you back? If the Lord Jesus Christ went clear to the cross to die for you, as we talked about in our class this morning, he left everything. He didn't think it was the being equality with God is something to be grasped. Without pressure, voluntarily, in eternity past, he agreed to go to the cross and pay for your sins. What more could God do for you? Why are you holding back? Why am I holding back? Why do I refuse to give up something that is keeping me from loving Jesus with all my heart and soul? Bottom line is sin. I love it. I love to deal with it. I love to think about it. I love to hold it. Well, you know what? You can't serve two masters. 
You're either going to hate the one and love the other. And I can tell you the one you're going to hate. You're going to hate God. So he goes on and he says, because of the corrupting influence of the old man, there's a responsibility on our heart to re part to reckon ourselves dead to sin. Colossians 3, 9, do not lie one to another since you've laid aside. Colossians 3, 5, therefore consider the members of your body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Romans 6, 11, even so consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. We can say, I don't have to do this. I don't have to let my mind go here. I don't have to let my thoughts go here. Like we say, if you got trouble with alcohol and you're alcoholic, you don't go into a liquor store to buy a Coke. Certain places you avoid an act of the will. Energized by the indwelling Holy Spirit it takes both, by the way. We have a group of people who talk about sanctification, that is growing in grace, that all you have to do is lay back, let God. That's not the way it works. Let me ask you something about a farmer. Most of you are familiar with farms and a farmer. Who causes a seed to grow? God. Who causes that seed to mature and become fruit? Does a farmer have anything to do with that? Is that a hard question? No! He can't make it grow. He can't make it produce an ear. He can't make it come to fruition. Farmer can't. Is he necessary? Absolutely he's necessary. He has to plant the seed. He has to cultivate that seed. He has to water that seed. He has to reap that seed. Both go together. Abe and I have been studying uh, during the week. We studied a passage of Scripture, a section of Scripture, where God set up the eternal kingdom or the mediatorial kingdom or the kingdom of Israel in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Set it up. It was a perfect government. When God gave all these laws to Moses, they were perfect. He took care of the poor by, he only worked six years. You let the sixth year go fallow. And then you didn't harvest that year. You got, enough, you got enough fruit on the sixth year, so you didn't have to do anything on the seventh year, the Sabbath. You had a Sabbath day that you worked six days, and you didn't work the seventh day. Now, on the sixth, day, on the sixth year, the poor could go out and gather well, all the volunteer corn, all the volunteer wheat. And when the six years were going on, you were not allowed, I don't know, some of you grew up, I grew up, we had to pick up corn of all things. That was a joyous work. Hated every minute of it. Walk down there, trip over the stocks, and throw them in this, this trailer that you got a dollar and fifty cents for a bushel. We could have we could have worked in town, made more money on what we were making on that. But the poor did it. The poor went out and reaped the corners. The poor went out like Ruth did and gleaned in the fields. You know what that did? It was a welfare system that didn't injure the person's ego or sense of well-being. Perfect. And you know, if you inherited some land, your father inherited the land, and he couldn't pay for it or he couldn't make it go, he could sell it, but every 49 years that land came back to the original family, and the son had an opportunity to take the same farm and see if he could make it. God had a perfect system. You know, he gave it to them. He gave them the land, but here is the human responsibility. We are saved by grace through faith, but what is our responsibility? to trust Him, to put our faith in Him, to yield to Him. 
God will take us to places that you and I can't imagine. But he's already, you already as a believer have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit within us. And if we yield to him, God will take us on further. You got to trust him. Well, I don't know if I can do this or not. You know, I had, I th well, when my wife reminded me this morning, six years ago, that we uh, voted to build this building, we were meeting back there, guys. We may have had a hundred. And we decided to borrow a million bucks. Uh, that's scary. That's scary. Some are scared to death. Some said you shouldn't borrow money. I don't think you should go out and tempt God and borrow five million. I, I'm not for that at all. But it was a step of faith. Has God met that need? Is he going to meet that need? Are you worried that he isn't going to meet that need? No. God always comes through. We have to believe and trust in him. Verse uh, 23 says that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now this little infinitival phrase is in the present tense. Look at Colossians 3, 9. I'll read it for you. Do not lie one another. We've already read that. Since you've laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. You know, here's what he's saying in essence. The more you receive of the word, the more you grow, and the more the changes come. You really want to be like God? You really want to be like Christ? You want to have a Christ-like life? Over the years, I've interviewed many people in counseling, some of them very young, high school age, college age, young marriage, some old. But I think to myself of a young person, how can a person 21 years old get himself into this big a mess? They think going to church is hard. They think living for the Lord is hard. <coughs> I'm not saying living for the Lord is easy, but I'll tell you what, it keeps you from a lot of messes. Constantly being renewed, which is a process which continues through one's life. This is in contrast with the putting off, put on. This is a spirit here refers to the mind, the human spirit. In Romans 8, 16, we read, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do we know that? We've got to know what's in the word. I've often wondered as a pastor sometimes, what is it that one person sits in church and when they're done, Let's go on with the week. I've done my duty. And another guy sitting in the same church, hearing the same message, singing the same songs, same age, walks out and says, man, it was refreshing. I really want to serve the Lord. I say about truth, it's like going in a cold shower. It really hurts when you go in, but when you get out, it's really refreshing. I get beat up by these messages myself. I'm no different than you. What is it that turns people on, so to speak? Why do some people just walk out and can't get enough of the word and another guy can't? You can talk about the price of eggs. You can talk about the price of milk. You can talk about the, whether you like Trump or not. You can talk about politics. You can talk about the Chiefs and the Niners. You can talk about basketball. You can talk about all these things. But you can't talk about Jesus. Like pulling hen's teeth for some people. What is it? What causes that? One of two things. 
They either have never laid aside the old self. And the other reason is they're not being renewed. You got to think about it. You got to think about it. These temptations come, as we'll see in Ephesians 6. They come. The doubts come. Sometimes I wonder. The only thing I have to go about that there's an eternal heaven and there's an eternal hell is what I read in this book. I don't get it anywhere else. Do you? Is there any other religion that talks about hell? Hardly. In fact, most evangelical churches have almost dropped the subject. But there's a holy God. And he said, the soul that sins shall die. The only place we can get it is in the Word. It's the only place you can be renewed. We can talk about climate change. You can talk about all those things, but they don't change lives. You can talk about being righteous without being born again. And what is that? So he says, be renewed. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We are so messed up in this world, we don't even know the difference anymore between male and female. The only way to straighten that out is for us to know the Word of God. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Bruce. He created man and woman. We know that. Plus the other nonsensical things that are out there in the world. We got to go back and see what the Word of God says and hold to it that we may know what is right and wrong. Isaiah 5 said, they start calling good bad and bad good. We're, there, we're in that age. Colossians 3.12. So then, as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. No excuse for bitterness among believers. No excuse for all of these other things. Forgive them and move on. I love this verse in the Bible. Philippians. Forgetting those things which are behind what? I move on. You know, I could look over my past, and I could become very discouraged. The stunts I've pulled, the things I've said, the things I've done. But as we sang this morning, his mercy is what? More. His mercy is more. Can I out sin the grace of God? No. A friend of mine in Salina, Kansas, who's now with the Lord during Second World War, they had two big major bases there. And he and his wife decided they're going to do something for the servicemen, so every Friday night they would serve chicken. And he'd go to the barracks and say, all the chicken you can eat over at such and such his house. His house, he said, we had guys in every room. He said, I don't even know where he got the money to buy all the chicken and stuff, but we got it somewhere. And we'd fry chicken with all the other extras and come in there, and after it was over, he would share the gospel. He would say, this is what it's all about, men. We're sinners, and we can be saved by grace and trust the Lord. And a lot of men came to know Christ. And it was said of him by others that he could drive within 100 miles of anywhere in the United States, there was somebody that was in his house that came to know Jesus Christ. One night he's coming home from work and he saw a guy drunk. So he decided he'd pick him up before the MPs did. Took him to his house, sobered him up. And the guy said, I've committed the worst horrible crime against my family, 
I am so ashamed. Can God forgive me? Pete lit a match, and he said, is there enough water in the ocean, Pacific Ocean, to put out this match? Yes. There's enough grace to forgive you. Where sin abounds, what? Grace does much more abound. You've received it. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you've laid that aside and you've put on a new man. Act like it. Live like it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us stand for prayer.